Number 17. Mr. and Mrs. Brown were going abroad for their holiday. They had a dog called Blackie, which they were very fond of. But they couldn't take him abroad with them, so they looked for a good place to leave him while they were away, and at last found a place which looked after dogs very well while their owners were away. They took Blackie there just before they left for their holiday and sadly said goodbye to him. At the end of their holiday, they got back to England very late at night, and as they thought that the place where Blackie was staying might be closed at that late hour, they decided to wait until the next morning before going to get him. So the next morning, Mr. Brown got into his car and drove off happily to collect Blackie. When he reached home with the dog, he said to his wife, Do you know, dear, I don't think Blackie can have enjoyed his stay at that place very much. He barked all the way home in the car as if he wanted to tell me something. Mrs. Brown looked at the dog carefully and then answered, You are quite right, dear. He was certainly trying to tell you something. But he wasn't trying to tell you that he hadn't enjoyed his stay at that place. He was only trying to tell you that you were bringing the wrong dog home. This isn't Blackie. Number 18 Nasruddin sat drinking coffee and talking with some of his old friends. One of the things they discussed was the difference between one person's sense of values and another's. After some minutes, one of Nasruddin's friends said to him, Well, Nasruddin, you are a wise man, but you've said nothing on this subject yet. What do you consider to be the most valuable thing in the world? Nasruddin answered without hesitation, I consider advice the most valuable thing in the world. His friends thought about this for a few moments, and then one of them asked him, And what do you consider the most worthless thing in the world? Again Nasruddin replied without hesitating for a moment, I consider advice the most worthless thing in the world. Really? said one of his friends. You must be joking, Nasruddin. A minute ago you said that advice is the most valuable thing in the world, and now you say that it's the most worthless thing in the world. How can it be both the most valuable and the most worthless? Well, answered Nasruddin, if you think about the matter carefully, you'll see that I'm not joking and that I'm quite right. When you give somebody good advice, and he takes it, advice is the most valuable thing in the world. But when you give a person advice and he doesn't take it, it is the most worthless thing in the world. Number 19. Mrs. Jones was over 80, but she still drove her old car like a woman half her age. She loved driving very fast, and boasted of the fact that she had never, in her 35 years of driving, been punished for a driving offence. Then, one day, she nearly lost her record. A police car followed her, and the policeman in it saw her pass a red light without stopping. When Mrs. Jones came before the judge, he looked at her severely and said that she was too old to drive a car and that the reason why she hadn't stopped at the red light was most probably that her eyes had become weak with old age so that she had simply not seen it. When the judge had finished what he was saying Mrs. Jones opened the big handbag she was carrying and took out her sewing. Without saying a word she chose a needle with a very small eye and threaded it at her first attempt. When she had successfully done this, she took the thread out of the needle again and handed both the needle and the thread to the judge, saying, Now it's your turn. I suppose you drive a car and that you have no doubts about your own eyesight. 
the judge took the needle and tried to thread it. After half a dozen attempts, he had still not succeeded. The case against Mrs. Jones was dismissed, and her record remained unbroken. Number 20. When a big ship is in very rough sea, it has to be able to bend a little, otherwise it may break in two. If one end of the ship is on the top of one huge wave, and the other end is on the top of another, with the middle of the ship hanging in between, or if one huge wave comes up under the middle of the ship, leaving the two ends hanging, the ship's own weight will break its back if it's quite stiff. To make a big ship elastic enough to avoid this danger, it has joints where the sections of the ship come together above the water line, and these joints open and shut slightly as the waves lift one section of the ship or another. This is enough to save the ship from breaking into pieces. One day, a sailor was walking along a passageway in a big ship during a storm when he was surprised to see a boy sitting comfortably in a chair at the end of the passageway which was opposite one of the ship's joints. The boy had a bag of nuts beside him and every time the ship was lifted by a wave and the joint opened, he put a nut in it. As the ship came down again, the joint closed and cracked the nut gently but firmly. The boy then took it out and put the next one in as the joint opened again. Number 21 Dick was a clever boy, but his parents were poor, so he had to work in his spare time and during his holidays to pay for his education. In spite of this, he managed to get to the university but it was so expensive to study there that during the holidays he found it necessary to get two jobs at the same time so as to earn enough money to pay for his studies. One summer he managed to get a job in a butcher's shop during the daytime and another in a hospital at night. In the shop he learned to cut meat up quite nicely so the butcher often left him to do all the serving while he went into a room behind the shop to do the accounts. In the hospital, on the other hand, he was, of course, allowed to do only the simplest jobs, like helping to lift people and to carry them from one part of the hospital to another. Both at the butcher's shop and at the hospital, Dick had to wear white clothes. One evening at the hospital, Dick had to help to carry a woman from her bed to the place where she was to have an operation. The woman was already feeling frightened at the thought of the operation before he came to get her. But when she saw Dick, that finished her. No, no, she cried, not my butcher. I won't be operated on by my butcher, and fainted away. Number 22 Nasruddin was a poor man, so he tried to grow as many vegetables as he could in his own garden, so that he would not have to buy so many in the market. One evening he heard a noise in his garden and looked out of the window. A white ox had got into the garden and was eating his vegetables. Nasruddin at once took his stick, ran out and chased the ox, but he was too old to catch it. When he got back to his garden, he found that the ox had ruined most of his precious vegetables. The next morning, while he was walking in the street near his house, he saw a cart with two white oxen, which looked very much like the one that had eaten his vegetables. He was carrying his stick with him, so he at once began to beat the two oxen with it. As neither of them looked more like the ox that had eaten his vegetables than the other, he beat both of them equally hard. 
The owner of the ox cart was drinking coffee in a coffee house. When he saw what Nasruddin was doing to his animals, he ran out and shouted, What are you doing? What have those poor animals done to you for you to beat them like that? You keep out of this, Nasruddin shouted back. This is a matter between me and one of these two oxen. He knows very well why I'm beating him. Number 23. The war had begun and George had joined the Air Force. He wanted to be a pilot and after some months he managed to get to the Air Force training school where they taught pilots to fly. There, the first thing that new students had to do was to be taken up in a plane by an experienced pilot to give them some idea of what it felt like. Even those who travelled as passengers in commercial airline planes before found it strange to be in the cockpit of a small fighter plane and most of the new students felt nervous. The officer who had to take the students up for their first flight allowed them to fly the plane for a few seconds if they wanted to and if they were not too frightened to try but he was always ready to take over as soon as the plane started to do dangerous things. George was one of those who took over the controls of the plane when he went up in it for the first time and after the officer had taken them from him again George thought that he'd better ask a few questions to show how interested he was and how much he wanted to learn to fly. There were a number of instruments in front of him so he chose one and asked the officer what it was. The officer looked at him strangely for a moment and then answered, That is the clock. Number 24 Mr. Robinson had to travel somewhere on business and as he was in a hurry he decided to go by air. He liked sitting beside a window when he was flying so when he got onto the plane, he looked for a window seat. He found that all of them had already been taken, except for one. There was a soldier sitting in the seat beside this one, and Mr. Robinson was surprised that he hadn't taken the one by the window. But anyhow, he at once went towards it. When he reached it, however, he saw that there was a notice on it. It was written in ink and said, This seat is reserved for proper load balance. Thank you. Mr. Robinson had never seen such a notice in a plane before, but he thought that the plane must be carrying something particularly heavy in its baggage room, which made it necessary to have the passengers properly balanced. So he walked on and found another empty seat, not beside a window, to sit in. Two or three other people tried to sit in the window seat beside the soldier, but they too read the notice and went on. Then, when the plane was nearly full, a very beautiful girl stepped into the plane. The soldier, who was watching the passengers coming in, quickly took the notice off the seat beside him, and in this way succeeded in having the company of the girl during the whole of the trip. 